Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you. Very good evening to you. My name is Rob Havers, president of the Marshall Foundation, and welcome to another event in the Marshall Legacy Series and in the World Wars sequence, where we endeavor to look how Marshall himself was shaped by those conflicts and how indeed he then went on to shape them. Marshall's relationship with civilian leaders such as FDR and Prime Minister Winston Churchill, as well as with many other members of the United States House and Senate, had a tremendous impact on his work as Chief of Staff of the Army during World War II. Tonight, we will focus very specifically on Marshall's relationship with President Roosevelt and the events in that critical year of 1943, a year in which George C. Marshall was recognized as Time Magazine's Man of the Year, but also the year in which FDR selected the man to lead the Allied invasion of occupied Europe, and Marshall was not he. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Nigel Hamilton as speaker this evening. Dr. Hamilton is an award-winning Anglo-American. Those Anglo-Americans seem to be everywhere these days. <laughs> Historian, biographer, currently completing the third volume of his FDR at War trilogy. He is known, of course, for his three-volume study of Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, Monty, legendary British commander of the 8th Army in North Africa, and of course, the commander of all Allied ground forces in Operation Overlord. Dr. Hamilton's many books have been translated into 17 languages, and he divides his time between Boston, where he is senior fellow at the McCormick Graduate School of the University of Massachusetts, and New Orleans, Louisiana. So ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Hamilton. Thank you very much, Rob, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I've spent the whole day in the Marshall Library archive, so if my voice is beginning to sound hoarse, it's because um, I'm still at it on volume three, but I hope to finish by the end of this year. And what I'm going to say tonight is um, drawn from uh, my uh, work, my manuscript uh, f of uh, volume three. So um, although the first two volumes are available upstairs, I saw um, the, the full story uh, will only be available once I complete the trilogy, hopefully at the end of this year. And and the book hopefully will get published next year. I thought I'd begin, well actually, one of the thoughts I had about beginning was in this week in which the president has just fired a senior <laughs> government official, <laughs> uh, just by reflecting on the, uh, the role of the president of the United States, which uh, I don't know if it's unique in this world, but it's, um, by our constitution, the president is automatically made commander in chief of the armed forces of the United States. And um, the uh, president has the right both to fire and to promote. And in this particular case that we're going to talk about this evening, the President of the United States was um, pressed to appoint the Commander-in-Chief of the D-Day Armies. And I thought I'd begin by reading from a, uh, a newspaper column that came out um, two days after Christmas in 1943. And uh, it was written by a, a UP press correspondent, Lyle Wilson. 
and it was headed, Eisenhower's appointment was smoked out by Stalin. I'll just read the last few lines. By the time Mr. Roosevelt and Churchill met Stalin, which is what they did at Tehran in late November 1943, by the time they met this month at Tehran, Western invasion plans were all set except in one respect. And the entire program was laid before the Russian leader. He evidently liked them as far as they went, but bluntly inquired who was to command. Mr. Roosevelt and Churchill sought to put the question aside. Stalin would not budge. He said that plans meant little without the name of the responsible man. That was why the president and the prime minister on returning to Cairo, on their way back to London and Washington, had to make an immediate decision. Why it was Eisenhower instead of Marshall who had been told at Quebec that he would get the, the job. Quebec was a few months before. Is a question awaiting the publication of somebody's memoirs. <laughs> well, many years later, <laughs> um, I'm writing a sort of memoir of FDR as Commander-in-Chief because FDR, as we know, didn't live to, to write his memoirs. He, he created what became really the first presidential library at Hyde Park. And he asked one of his map room staff officers who had a Harvard degree, like my wife, uh, if he would start assembling his papers so that when he uh, finished his term of office or, and the war, or the war ended, he could start writing his memoirs. Uh, but um, in April 1945, he, the 12th of April, he died. And, um, and so it was left up to the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who had already written many, many books to write his memoirs of World War II. Not just one book, not just two books, <laughs> six volumes, which helped him to win the Nobel Prize, not for history, but for literature. And that account of war at the very highest level uh, has dominated historiography, the, the way we have recorded the past for the last 70 years. And so one of the things I'm trying to do in these three volumes is to adjust the scales, shall we say, and to show that um, uh, Churchill's portrait of the president as commander in chief uh, is, is, uh, is very um, slanted. <laughs> and that um, to a large extent, the view of President Roosevelt as uh, a president, a politician, a, a, a statesman who left the running of the war largely to his military team uh, is in many ways a fabrication of the British Prime Minister who wanted 
to paint a portrait of World War II as a, a grand affair in which a grand alliance won the war with Winston Churchill as its architect. So let's get down to business. That's my preamble. Uh, Marshall and the President. Where does George Catlett Marshall come into this story? D-Day, Operation Overlord, as it was codenamed, was planned to be the largest amphibious invasion in human history. The selection of its supreme commander late in 1943 was therefore of huge and historic importance as everyone in military circles was aware. And certainly that journalist, that uh, UP journalist was aware. Who should it be though? Even Stalin, whose forces would mount an equivalent offensive from the east, became fretful at the Big Three Tehran Conference in November 1943, predicting Overlord would fail unless the right commander was immediately appointed in sufficient time to ensure victory. Stalin was right, though not for the reasons he imagined. For Franklin Roosevelt, as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States, for him the problem was not who to appoint, but how to stop the British from sabotaging the invasion. And to do this, paradoxically, he had needed to hold back on the appointment of its commander to the very last moment. Throughout 1943, as I've related in Commander-in-Chief FDR's battle with Churchill 1943, that's the second volume, the British Prime Minister and his military chiefs of staff had fought the President and the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff, their supposed coalition partners, rather than the enemy. It was a sorry saga. In May 1943, they'd come to America in their hundreds on a transatlantic liner, the Queen Mary, to do battle against Overlord. Though they failed, they were back in North America to try it yet again, three months later, in August 1943, aboard the same ocean liner, bringing more than 200 assistants and clerks. The British team did not believe in Overlord, preferring the idea of postponement, postponement for yet another year or more, while meantime exploiting Allied cities in the Mediterranean, striking east into the Aegean, forcing Turkey into the war, and advancing north through the Balkans, possibly even invading Germany from Austria and the Danube. The president and his American team had said no, the terrain was awful. The Germans were defending every yard. And the strategy, especially the idea of forcing the Dardanelles and entering the Black Sea, was woolly and more reminiscent of Churchill's disastrous campaign at Gallipoli in 1915 than the current war. By threatening to exclude Britain from further research to develop an atomic bomb, the president had managed to quell Churchill's insurrection in August 1943 at Quebec, however. 
and to make sure that the Allies stuck to the cross-channel invasion and its timetable. May the 1st, 1944. FDR insisted it should be commanded by an American, not a Briton. Churchill was thus forced to back down at Quebec and to tell General Sir Alan, Alan Brooke, his British Army Chief of Staff, that he, Brooke, would not lead the invasion General George Marshall would. Brooke was hurt by the decision, he later admitted, but certainly not devastated. He didn't think Overlord could possibly succeed. After all, it was quite a challenge. Not even Hitler had dared attempt a cross-channel invasion in the summer of 1940, when France was prostrate and prostrate. <laughs> my age, and defeated. Churchill, for his part, simply paid lip service to the formal Quebec Agreement, which made Overlord the Allies' absolute priority with a target launch date of May the 1st, 1944. Instead of sticking to a fall and winter strategy of limited operations on the mainland of Italy while preparing for the cross-channel assault in May, he therefore launched British invasions of Rhodes, Kos, Leros and Samos in the Aegean without American consent or even knowledge in Washington. The Wehrmacht had no difficulty in crushing the British forces in September and October, killing, capturing, or forcing their evacuation from each island in the Aegean to a man. Instead of swallowing defeat, however, Churchill went mad. That's a quotation from Sir Alan Brooks' diary. He, instead of swallowing defeat, he declared a third war against the President and the United States Chiefs of Staff, demanding that D-Day be postponed for a further year while the Allies tried more operations in the Mediterranean and the Aegean. It was in this dark context that the president was compelled to mount a counteroffensive against his own ally, using General Marshall as his weapon or chess piece, depending on how one views the crisis which enveloped the Allies in the fall of 1943. Crisis, a word Churchill used since he was its progenitor, was no misnomer. By late October 1943, Churchill was openly threatening to resign as Prime Minister unless the president's strategy agreed at Quebec was overturned and unless priority was switched to the Mediterranean, the Aegean and the Balkans. President Roosevelt duly attempted to hold Churchill's feet to the fire by simply ignoring his predictions of disaster and defeat and instead insisting they stick to the Quebec Accords. <laughs> 
It was to no avail, however, the Prime Minister persuading even his own sceptical British Chiefs of Staff to agree to his demands for an Anglo-American military conference or showdown to decide the issue before they all met with Stalin in Tehran at the end of November. Embarking with the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the latest U.S. battleship, the USS Iowa. Has anybody been to see the battleship? Great. I'm still waiting, but it's, it's in Los Angeles, isn't it? Oh, wow. More historic. Well, I want to go aboard one day. But um, it's actually the first chapter of the, my final volume when the President of the United States, it's pretty extraordinary to think he goes out on this battleship across the Atlantic in the middle of the war to North Africa on his way to meet Stalin. Anyway, on board that battleship on November the 12th, the President worked out a new plan to deal with the British insurrection. They would, this was the plan, they would refuse to discuss any change in the Quebec agreement while they were in Cairo en route to Tehran. Instead, they would use General Marshall as a chess queen to attack Churchill's king. demanding that Marshall not only assume command of Overlord, but of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, too. That way, Marshall would be able to put the kibosh on any Churchillian attempts to delay or deprioritize D-Day. And if that plan, that counteroffensive, failed, as the president felt it probably would, then it would leave no more time in Cairo to discuss Churchill's alternative strategy before flying on to Tehran to meet Stalin on November the 27th. There, in the legendary capital of the kings of Persia, Stalin would, the president had gotten confirmation from his ambassador in Moscow, help him to put down the British revolt two against one. And so it transpired. Churchill refused. I will not go ahead with this. Churchill refused to accept Marshall as an all-Europe, that's what the president called it, supreme commander. And so the British-American teams went to Tehran at log loggerheads. And there, Stalin assisted the president in squashing Churchill's wild dreams with a display of cold military realism that impressed even General Sir Alan Brooke. The Soviets would launch an equivalent grand offensive from the east, simultaneous with the launch of Overlord on May the 1st, 1944. The Wehrmacht would be crushed in between these two grand offensives, and the war against Hitler would be won. After that, the Soviets would join forces with the United States to defeat Japan. The president was delighted. Overlord would be even Hitler conceded the deciding battle of the war which left only the question, who would command it? 
in Tehran, it was assumed that General Marshall would be appointed. Indeed, Stalin was so impressed by Marshall's bearing and his military intellect that he couldn't understand why the president was still holding off on making the appointment official. The president assured him he would do so, he would do so however, in two or three days, as soon as, just as soon as he got back to Cairo. And he did, though not in the way Stalin or Marshall or anyone else had supposed. Now, General Marshall had been made the U.S. Army Chief of Staff by President Roosevelt during his second term in 1939. He won the president's respect for his coolness in all situations, his military bearing, his absence of ego, his devotion to duty, and his high-level administrative ability, setting goals and delegating necessary authority to competent subordinates. He'd earned the respect, too, of Congress in the many hearings he'd been required to attend for budgetary and other reasons. But as a combat commander, supreme commander, here the president was not so sure. Too much, perhaps, the delegator. Marshall was also not infallible as a military strategist or in his assessment of combat capabilities, American, German or Japanese. Marshall had failed to predict or prepare for a possible Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. He'd pressed for a cross-channel attack in 1942, before a single shot had been fired by an American at the Wehrmacht, had protested against the president's American-led torch invasion of Northwest Africa, prophesying that it would fail. He'd held back Eisenhower's forces in Morocco after the invasion, in fear of an unlikely German flank assault across the Mediterranean. And he'd argued for a cross-channel invasion again in 1943 before US commanders and forces had proven <coughs> that they could worst the Wehrmacht in battle. Therefore, finding himself embarrassed by Allied defeat at Kasserin, he was not in short necessarily the commander-in-chief the president thought of as the kind of effective supreme commander necessary for a coalition operation as critical as Overlord. Even more influential in the president's mind was the fact that General Pershing, the aging but venerated commander of US troops in Europe in World War I, felt strongly that it would be wrong to move General Marshall from Washington, as he'd written to the president in no uncertain terms back in September. And we have somebody here tonight who was handling that very piece of paper at the Library of Congress. So Pershing had argued that Overlord was only a part of the global chessboard and therefore was beneath Marshall's talents. Mr. Roosevelt had responded that he was thinking of an all Europe command, not just Northern Europe, in which case Marshall should surely be given the opportunity to make history. But now that Stalin had helped put down the British revolt, Overlord was the Allied priority. 
and its timetable was set in stone. With no chance Churchill would agree to Marshall taking command of all Europe, North and South, France, Mediterranean, Middle East, Overlord would be a major colour in the tapestry of war, but only one colour. Pershing's advice, early in December when the president came back from Tehran, now seemed eminently sensible, which left only the president's quasi-promise to Marshall if the general wanted the historic overlord invasion command. Did he want it? The president had never actually told Marshall directly that he wanted him to command the invasion. Even the minutes of the meetings aboard the Iowa battleship on its way out to the Mediterranean had a recorded, I've checked this in the minutes, had recorded an assumption by the president rather than a decision. And one based on the idea, after all, of an all-Europe command. Marshall had told his wife to begin moving furniture into storage pending his move and had even alerted some of his chosen staff, as I have found this afternoon in Marshall Archive upstairs in one of the wonderful oral histories which Forrest Pogue did. So he'd even alerted some of his own staff he'd probably be needing them abroad all too soon. In fact, in this particular oral history I was looking at an hour ago, he told his assistant, his colonel, like his secretary, that he might, this was on his return from Tehran, that he might well need to go straight back to Washington and prepare to move to London. And yet, Marshall was too astute to count his chickens before they hatched. On arrival of the battleship's arrival in Iran, He'd asked for tropical clothes, not London wear. And to Eisenhower, whom he saw in Tunis, he'd complained that he felt they were both like chess pieces on a board. I found that in, a, in an unpublished uh, memoir by, written by Eisenhower himself. Like chess pieces on a board which the president was playing with. In other words, when the president got back from Tehran, having promised Stalin he would make a decision very soon, Marshall, who had assumed he would be the choice, recognized it wasn't necessarily a done deal. Harry Hopkins, the president's Weiss, White House counselor, arrived at Marshall's villa in Cairo on the second evening after they got back. And he came not to tell Marshall that he was going to command all the Allied forces at D-Day, but to ask what Marshall's feelings were about the command. And when he did that, Marshall realized exactly what this meant, that the president was having second thoughts. But, and this is what I want to ask tonight, were they really his second thoughts? Or were they his first? Had the president ever really been willing to let Marshall go?
the president was wont to explain his sphinx-like decision-making process, and he was staying in a villa right next to the sphinx in Cairo. <laughs> and even in his diary, which I found, he mentions the fact. He was wont to explain his sphinx-like decision-making process, saying that he had two hands. The left one often didn't know what the right one did. In other words, he liked to hold at least two options open in making any decision. He was probably the most instinctive strategist ever to occupy the Oval Office, exerting his leadership by a kind of magic in which each supplicant thought he had the president's actual or implied support. It led to a thousand crossed wires and frustrations, but he, Franklin Roosevelt, towered so high above any other politician or leader in the nation that few beyond certain isolationist newspaper moguls dared openly cross him. He swept people along as if on a half idealistic, half-realistic journey that was forever positive and forward-looking. He was, in short, hard to know, but easy to love, at least from a distance. It is thus beyond doubt, mine at least, that General Marshall knew what Hopkins' visit on December the 3rd, 1943, meant. He, Marshall, had thought himself the favorite for the post because Marshal Stalin had so often, so obviously taken a liking to him in Tehran and had pressed the president again and again to make the crucial decision. But that was not what Hopkins's inquiry or his manner suggested. Rather, they implied the president was seeking, as he so often did, a way out. Wood telling Hopkins that he, George Marshall, had counted on getting the command, that he wanted it, that he felt he was the right man to take it, would that have helped change or sway the president's mind? It is doubtful. Marshall was Marshall and could not become a Patton-like or even MacArthur-like ego-led commander overnight. The president had used him as his chess queen to keep Churchill on the defensive and had gotten what he wanted, D-Day. He didn't actually need Marshall in that battlefield command capacity. Trying to convince the president he should go against his instinct, an instinct that had served the president so extraordinarily well since Pearl Harbor, would only make the inevitable decision more difficult for the president and the future path more stony. Whether Marshall slept that night, we do not know. As Dr. Forrest Pogue, his authorized biographer, whom I knew, put it, the general's prose, General Marshall's prose in his personal correspondence tended to be laconic, which made it the despair of the biographer. <laughs> the next day, however, after the morning chiefs of staff meeting, the president invited Marshall to his villa overlooking the pyramids and the Sphinx alone for lunch after a certain amount of beating about the bush the president told him he was going to give the overlord command to young 
General Eisenhower, with whom he'd spent two days on his way to Cairo and another day in Cairo itself before he'd flown on to Tehran. It was Saturday, December the 4th, 1943. The other chiefs of staff were told after lunch, the British chiefs and their prime minister, that evening. How did Marshall react? He must have been upset as any soldier would be to be passed over. The president, in his charming way, had sugared the pill by saying it was best so since he wouldn't be able to sleep in Washington without him there. But in later years, Marshall couldn't remember correctly even the day he'd been told, or whether it was before lunch, or after, or during lunch. All historians since then have gotten the date wrong following Marshall's mistake, ascribing this the most consequential command appointment of World War II to the incorrect day, claiming it was December the 5th when it was really December the 4th. In the meantime, though, as soon as the president sent his cable to Stalin, formally announcing his decision on the night of December the 6th, two days later, as he prepared to leave Cairo for the journey home back to Washington, Marshall decided to go in the opposite direction, to the Pacific, without even telling the president. There, on the far side of the world, he would meet the US commanders in the field, such as MacArthur. He would also have time to collect his thoughts, his grief, as Dr. Pogue put it, and would return several weeks later to Washington, the straight-laced, no-nonsense general, the US Army Chief of Staff, everyone knew and admired. Stalin, after mulling it over, thought it a good choice. The Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, however, didn't take the news nearly so well. It was, he confided in his diary, a, a revolutionary change of mind, and his first impression was that it was a great mistake. But as history would show, it wasn't. Not simply because young General Eisenhower proved a genius at welding together in five short months the forces of a rainbow coalition of nations and putting them into successful battle against the vaunted legions of the Wehrmacht, but because of something equally significant. In fact, even more significant than Gen General Pershing could have predicted. For although the president returned from Tehran bronzed and in robust good health as everyone who saw him averred, he fell sick with flu a few days after Christmas 1943, and it never got better. By March 1944, racked with bronchitis, he was examined by specialists and diagnosed to be dying. His heart, like his father's, was suffering fatal cardiac disease. As President and Commander-in-Chief, Mr. Roosevelt would still have some important decisions to make. But to all intents and purposes, he was, like President Wilson in 1920, an invalid. With the United States fighting a global war, it would fall to his loyal U.S. Army Chief of Staff, General George C. Marshall, 
to be the linchpin of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff in achieving final victory over Nazi Germany and Japan. And keeping him in Washington was one of the finest decisions Franklin Delano Roosevelt ever made. Thank you. Now I'm happy to take any easy questions. <laughs> now, any questions at all? Yes, sir. No, just one per person. <laughs> Sure. Well, and that was very much what uh, General Pershing was saying to the president. But we live in a country um, with a colorful press, <laughs> media. And there had been a tremendous build-up. Uh, I think Rob mentioned the Time magazine. There had been this huge build-up of the, the sort of heroes of the war. Uh, which is natural in in uh, during wartime, and so you know everybody was waiting for this. They called it the second front to be mounted, and people in those days didn't see that as a just a, one piece of the chessboard. They saw that really as the culminating battle that would, and that's how Hitler saw it. So, and because in this country we like to dramatize things, <laughs> it was considered that that, you know, you were going to be the star of the star campaign. So I think, you know, since World War II, because Marshall became such an extraordinary figure as uh, Secretary of State and for the Marshall Plan and so forth, he, uh, we tend to look back at it and s see him as this grand global figure. But at that moment, certainly in the United States, everyone was assuming that was, I think uh, Stephen Ambrose in his biography of Eisenhower, who did get the post, said that it was the most coveted command post in United States military history. And I think, you know, I've been through the, the diary uh, kept by Eisenhower's um, naval aide, actually, he was his media aide, but uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Butcher. And, you know, you, you'd think from this diary that the headquarters, Mediterranean he headquarters, uh, had nothing better to do than to speculate as to who was going to get this job. I mean, it was it was the big thing of that time. Everybody was waiting for it, not least Stalin. Sir? What kind of relationship had, had uh, Roosevelt had prior to this with Eisenhower? Did he just pick him out of nowhere? Or what, what drove him to choose Eisenhower? Well, Eisenhower briefly... Eisenhower had served under Marshall in the War Plans Division at the time of Pearl Harbor. And because the president, in the chaos after Pearl Harbor, was having to send messages to Hawaii, to the Philippines, to he, he was seeing a lot of Marshall and Marshall's staff. Marshall would basically come and camp at the White House and because they were having to send so many signals out. And so, uh, for instance, uh, in my first volume, there is a very dramatic moment when Ma uh, MacArthur is on the point 
of surrendering US American forces in the Philippines. And the president has to make a decision. I came across another oral history today. It's a great archive you have <laughs> uh, about this very tense moment. And um, the president, the, the secretary of war was there, Marshall was there, and General Eisenhower, well, he, I think he was still a colonel, yeah, was there. And it, it, they, they were there partly to give the president military advice, partly to help him frame in, in sort of military parlance the best way of sending a signal. But in that particular case, on that day, it was up to the commander in chief, the president, to make a decision. Should American troops surrender then or not? And the president makes that decision. And Marshall is on record saying, that is when I realized the president wasn't just a politician, he was a great man. Because Marshall sends, I mean, the president sends this wonderful signal to, uh, to MacArthur saying, well, the Philippine, Philippine troops can surrender, but no American is going to surrender. This is in February. We, we have to show that we are going to fight the Japanese. The British may have surrendered Singapore outnumbering the Japanese three to one, but we are not going to go down that road. So, so he'd, he'd gotten to know Eisenhower in that um, context. Then he, the president, had appointed Eisenhower to take command of what would have been an early D-Day in 19, the summer of 1942, but then it was decided to make it into torch, the invasion of Northwest Africa, Morocco. And Eisenhower commanded Torch, so so that it's at that point that he really becomes this allied or coalition commander, and the president didn't always agree with him um, by any means. Um, but he, on his way out in November of '43, as he goes out on the battle. Ship. He lands at Oran, comes off the battleship, and he's met by Eisenhower. And Eisenhower flies with him from Oran to um, Tunis, to Carthage. And they spend two days together. And I came across a wonderful little memory that Eisenhower had written that wasn't published. When he takes the president around the battlefields, not only of Carthage during the <laughs> pre-Roman Empire, <laughs> I mean, as we, you know, in the 200 BC and 100 BC, but, but the recent Tunisian battlefields with examples of, you know, burned out tanks and so forth. And they spend these two days together and, and the president actually talks to him about Marshall and this command and he says you know who who who's ever going to he doesn't know Marshall's going to become famous for the Marshall plan <laughs> he says who's going to remember the chief of staff of the United US army after this war whereas everyone can remember you know who were the great commanders in the civil war and so you know it was very much something that Eisenhower was aware of, the president was aware of, Marshall was aware of. But as I've tried to explain, it wasn't that the president couldn't make up his mind. It was that he, Churchill was being such a... <laughs> yes. And, uh, and then finally he did. So he saw him for those two days. And then when he, just before they left for Tehran, Eisenhower came and gave a a kind of appreciation, which he was very good at, um, of the situation in the Mediterranean and what the Allies could could do, sort of plan A or plan B, either the cross-channel attack or go on in the Mediterranean. And the president liked the, the uh, presentation he gave. So m my feeling is he'd made up his own mind as to, he didn't want to lose Marshall and he 
was quite keen on Eisenhower. He felt Eisenhower had, Eisenhower had been in command of, of truly allied forces, French, Polish, whatever, f for a year. I mean, it was just the president's sense of honor, if you like, that he'd, he, he ought to give Marshall the chance to command it if he really, really wanted it. And it's a great testament to Marshall that Marshall realizes the moment the president doesn't come to him, but Harry Hopkins and doesn't offer He knows the president doesn't want, to, want him to take it. And so very nobly he says, you must do what you want, Mr. President. Questions, questions. Churchill. <laughs> the um, unpublished sources that you're coming across, have they been, have other historians used those? Are you still finding more sources? <clears throat> oh, I think the wonder if, oh, if we, in going through these source materials, are these are these uh, records that other historians haven't seen, or is this is this known? Um, there are always new things to find. Always, they may not necessarily. I mean, I, they may not necessarily necessarily revolutionise our understanding of an event, but they can certainly um, help us to understand it better and give it greater color, if you like. Um, in the case of what I'm trying to do as FDR's military biographer, I do want to change history. I do feel that Churchill uh, has monopolized our view of World War II because he was such an incredibly good writer. Uh, and and he was also not a bad historian. I mean, he he and he also, when he uh, was voted out of office in 1945, he had these trucks come to 10 Downing Street, and he stole all the government records <laughs> relating to his prime ministership, and they're all now at Churchill College, Cambridge, and. So in writing those six volumes over a period of whatever it was, seven, eight years, he, he had access to documents that no American or British or French historian had. And he was able to select from those his own account of how he had always really been right and he was really the true architect and the president was really very kind <laughs> benevolent <laughs> but but you know was was just an, a kind of an associate and um so i am trying to change that view of world war ii uh and i should add it's not because i have any animus against winston churchill uh, because um, I was telling Rob earlier, I am the last person on this earth to have stayed with Winston Churchill outside his family. When I stayed with him at, um, at his home in Chartwell, which is now a museum just south of London, um, in his old age, and... Uh, I have a very fond memory of my weekend. I was a university student and probably should have listened more carefully to what was being said. But the, tr the real problem, I was 19, was that he was, church was, the, there was a dinner and the uh, Clemmy Churchill made her bedroom into the dining room because it was on the same level as Winston, so he wouldn't have to go upstairs or downstairs. And he was brought into the dining room on the arms of these two beautiful, sorry about this, these 
two beautiful Swedish blonde nurses. <laughs> it, was, it was difficult to concentrate on. <laughs> Somebody else had a question? Sir? Churchill seemed to have a much better understanding of Joseph Stalin than Roosevelt did. Do you think part of his reaction to Stalin's assassination was that he was just a Well, that's what Churchill argued, but it's very interesting. I was just reading some of uh, Forrest Pogue's oral, oral histories upstairs. Um, nobody in the American Chiefs of Staff thought that was the... They, neither, they didn't think it was the real reason Churchill was proposing Balkan strategy and so forth. They, they felt he was inventing that after the war. Uh, and in any case, they all said, I mean, they drew up whole reports and saying, this is absolutely ridiculous. The terrain in that part of southern Europe is not conducive to getting to Berlin. And were they right? You know, Churchill almost single-handedly, and here I feel quite passionate about this, the president thought he'd he'd won the 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 battle for for D-Day, and so the president returned from Tehran, Cairo, and Tehran, thinking that he'd he triumphed, he'd gotten Stalin to help him put down this British insurrection, but he he the president falls ill almost immediately after Christmas. Churchill f also falls ill exactly the same time from pneumonia. And in fact, there were, there was, there were rumors going around uh, Washington, and I've seen in the diary of the British ambassadors, saying that uh, Churchill had died. You know, it was really serious. And, but Churchill was Churchill, as somebody said. <laughs> and he recovered. The president never really did. And in recovering, I don't, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, sometimes when people recover from a serious illness, you know, they're madder still. <laughs> and what does Churchill do while he is meant to, he, the president flies from Cairo to Tehran to, uh, sorry, the president flies from Cairo to Tunis and stays in Eisenhower's villa there and then flies back to Dakar and then takes his, the battleship back to America. Two days after he leaves Eisenhower's villa at Tunis, who arrives? Winston Churchill. Who stays at Eisenhower's villa in Tunis? for another two weeks, does not return to London. Who invents one of the biggest blunders of World War II that cost 10,000 American lives and over 30,000 American casualties at Anzio? Winston Churchill single-handedly takes this operation which General Mark Clark had looked at and decided wasn't going to probably work, single-handedly takes it over. He's refused to allow Marshall to become supreme commander of all Europe. The president has had to make do with Eisenhower of, as command, supreme commander just of the cross-channel invasion, but a Brit will command the Mediterranean. Two Brits, a new supreme commander he brings in from the Middle East, General Maitland Wilson, and his blue-eyed boy, General Sir Harold Alexander who was on a famous cricket team in England 
against Churchill's old school and whom Churchill revered. And Field Marshal Montgomery, whom I knew very well, was scathing about Alexander. And these two Brits simply did not have the the um, strength of mind, of will, of intellect. And certainly you needed a big intellect to argue against Winston Churchill. They didn't have the strength of mind to tell Winston Churchill, go back to London and leave the campaign in Italy to professionals. And, and here was Winston Churchill who, who ordered this operation 30 miles from Rome, 30 miles south of Rome, saying that it would take less than two weeks for the Allies to take Rome. And it was an absolute disaster. It delayed D-Day for a month because it needed these landing, American landing craft to supply the troops that were stuck on the beach and couldn't get out through the hills. So I feel very strongly that Winston Churchill had no appreciation. After all, he'd grown up in you know, his his battle experience was on the northwest frontier in the nineteenth century. That Churchill never understood, and I talked to Field Marshal Montgomery many times about this. Churchill had no tactical understanding of modern warfare, and particularly of modern geography in terms of warfare. And had the Allies decided not to go ahead with D-Day and had instead followed Churchill's uh, alternative strategy in the late fall of 1943, I say this as a historian, I think we might very well have failed to win World War II in Europe. Because the American chiefs of staff were not going to put up with that any longer. And they were quite prepared to switch to the Pacific. After all, why should American kids be sent to die for Churchill's fantasies in Rhodes or the Dodecanese Islands? It wasn't right, it wasn't fair, and it was unrealistic all because Churchill had fantasies of driving into Rome like a Roman Caesar. I may be overstating this, but I do feel very strongly. <laughs> well, I may be overstating this slightly. <laughs> because, it, no, there are many people who've, who have argued that uh, Churchill was politically um, very astute and that he read Stalin better than the president. My own view is that the president read Stalin exactly the same as Churchill. The question was, how do you deal with this man who's rather important in terms of defeating Nazi Germany? Nigel Hamilton, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> We have a small token of our esteem, Nigel. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Nigel will be upstairs at our reception signing copies of his first two volumes. So if you'd like to purchase and get a, a, an inscription, he will be up there delighted to take more questions, I'm sure. I've been to many Churchill conferences over the years with my Churchill hat on. And Nigel is a persistent and popular and return speaker at very many of them. The Churchillians love to hear him and love to throw the the questions back at him. So Nigel, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Join us at the reception. Good job. Thank you.